Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Sabatino from Gallery Le Long, and I have the pleasure of welcoming all of us in the gallery and those of us who are listening online to our 10th conversation of Dialogues. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Michelle Stewart and Alexis Lowry, who will be in conversation. This conversation is being filmed and recorded for posterity. So first, I'm going to give you a little intro of our two marvelous speakers. Since the 1960s, Michelle Stewart has created a multifaceted body of work, I'm sorry, body of work that defies categorization, as you can see by the works around us. She has done large-scale earthworks, collages, drawings, photography, and sculpture. She has devoted her decades-long practice to recording and studying traces upon the earth and the imprint of time and history. She maps the passage of time and space, retrieving histories as she makes them aware of their irretrievability and the fugitive nature of time and history and evolution of the creation and of voyage. Um, even when working with photography, Michelle perceives it as an imprinting process, researching and rephotographing and sometimes taking the photographs herself. I hope you'll all have a chance to view the exhibition in person if you're looking online. Alexis Lowry is a curator at the Dia Art Foundation where she oversees acquisitions and collections for the permanent collection, as well as commissions across all of the Dia sites. At Dia Chelsea, she oversees or oversaw the project of Lucy Raven, Rita McBride, and Kiyosho Suga as well as installations by Mel Bachner, Mary Course, Charles Gaines, Barry LeVay, and could go on and on. Prior to Dia, Alexis was the curator at the David Winton Bell Gallery at Brown University in Providence and a freelance curator for Creative Time New York. She was the first invited curator in residence at the Bauhaus in Dessau, Germany. She has written many artists' monographs, and she received her PhD in 2019 from NYU, from the, I'm sorry, the Institute of Fine Arts. And if you're looking to see Michelle's work outside of Gallery Le Long, you can visit her incredible Sayreville Strata in permanence, we hope, at Dia Art Foundation. Thank you, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mary. Um, before we go, Further, um, if you can't hear us at any point, can you guys out in the actual physical audience just raise your hand for us so we know to talk loud? And we're going to chat for about 45 minutes and then we will turn it over for questions. And I also want to thank Mary and everybody at Gallery Lee Long for the incredibly lovely invitation to come speak with one of my favorite people. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Michelle, for this incredible exhibition, which um, is just saturated with pleasure um, and I'm really excited to talk to you about it. What I'm hoping we can do today is we in, a, in previous conversations have kind of identified a few themes to discuss today. Um, the first being a kind of general overview of the exhibition and we're going to talk a little bit about memoir and then memory and then uh, self and self portraiture and finally place and we may or may not get to all of those topics but it kind of gives you a roadmap for where we're going. And with that, I wanted to start with a kind of somewhat obvious observation that the works on view in this exhibition span the entirety of your career and present- Almost. Almost, right? Pretty close. Almost. Yeah. So survey, not a retrospective. Well, I worked all during the 60s and there, the, there's only one piece at the end. Right, yes. right. Which as you were saying earlier is kind of a transition piece. So your early 60s work is plaster and this, First show piece in the sh or earliest piece in the show is 69. It's called Imprints. Can you tell everybody what, how you made it? No. <laughs> <laughs> or what its relationship? It's a plaster you were already working with your hands. It it was it was um, I had done in the 60s a series of boxes. Yeah. Both black boxes with sculpture in them. Yep. And. Um, and white boxes with sculptures in them. <laughs> um, 
then I then I I went to the south, and when I went to the south, I started going to uh, I started visiting Native American sites that still exist that were you know old like it too well in mm -hmm. in Georgia, and um, I started being more interested in the earth from the site. So instead of putting sculpture in the boxes, I started putting earth in the boxes, just the earth, because it indicated the place. You have that beautiful one where it's kind of encrusted around the surface and that's and, and falls falling. out. Yeah. Um, this one was part of that series. And it was done with um, with some earth and structurolite and hydrocal. But what I wanted was I wanted to touch it so that I left my mark with the place. So you see on the on the probably the left yep. box, there's it's padded. And I never thought about it at the time, but curiously, that kind of started the frottage. Right, that was your beginning of touch being a kind exactly. of central part yeah, of your Yeah, kind life. of embracing the place and the earth of the place and it, they're all in the work. I love it for me because it also marks what I think is one of the central themes that run throughout your work or many of them actually, but one of them is kind of intimacy. And um, I think it's Lucy Lepard who describes it um, as the kind of certain kind of um, intense and int intensified intimacy that is manifest in the surfaces of your work. But it also, you know, it's these two rectilinear forms. It starts to show your, the grid is gonna be a really important theme throughout your career. We can see that here as well behind us. Um, well, this is actually 10 years later than that one. Right. Approximately. But so you see the kind of first gesture getting scaled up, yes. right? Yeah. Um, and it also, also. <laughs> right, this is monumental. <laughs> That's very, it's also intimate because of its scale. Um, the other thing that I think has run throughout your career is this kind of, on the one hand, an emphasis on gathering and arranging bits of information, so kind of fragments of information. And on the other hand, kind of contradictory emphasis on abstraction. Right. Um, and then, well, I think what I mean by that is that you arrange materials very specifically. You can see this here in what seems like very kind of ordered logic, right? But at the same time, the material remains obscure or there's something that's kind of withheld that's very personal, it reads to me. So it kind of resists the structure of the taxonomy that it suggests in its form. That's an interesting view, actually, because it, it has both. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, you're, if what you say is correct, it has the withholding, but then it has the direct confrontation in the photograph. True, but even the photographs are these, they're always kind of these close-ups, they're tight shots. So you get one thing here that's really focused, but you don't get the wider, they're not kind of huge landscapes. And I, it's something that I really admire also about the large fully photographic works too, right? There's a um, kind of intimacy even in this kind of most um, uh, scientific. Yeah, see, I think, I mean, this is, what, yeah. this is a viewer's thing, and yeah. I don't think the artist necessarily thinks about that. Yeah. I think, well, I can speak for myself. I do it intuitively. I mean, I do almost everything intuitively. I don't plan what I'm going to do with the thought in mind. I, yeah. It's like, this works, and then this works. So you're building it or as you go. Yeah. But, but it, it's, it's about, it's about, it's really about intuitively working. And, and that's pretty much. Now, on the other hand, do I choose where I go? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the predetermined part. Then you gather the material, you bring it home with you, and right. then that's where the intuitive right. process comes right. into play. Right. 
Another thing that I think happens in your work is, um, the, or the through line that you already pointed to here with imprints is the idea of the imprint or what art historians call the index, which I know is not a term that resonates with you, but I, <laughs> but I wonder if another way instead we could kind of reframe that to, be, to think about processes of inscription and a kind of practice of writing in and the way in which that can be have a memorializing or mnemonic function, um, kind of um, act of memory. Or, um, and I'm thinking about how paper That's interesting. Yeah. kind of functions yeah. in your work. I, I actually think that's true. And did you think about writing? So when you started using the scrolls and the books and, you know, the, I, I suppose the vocabulary of the written word or the support structures of the written word. Words are very important to me. Yeah. <laughs> but well, I mean, they may be important to everyone, but they're very important to me. Yeah. I mean, if you take some of the titles, yes, you can, which I can never remember, but I did make them. <laughs> <laughs> they were on purpose at the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of the titles came from Finnegan's Wake, uh, right. you know, in the eighties, because I thought that was. To fascinating use of words. Mm -hmm. um, any of us, in fact. Mm -hmm. and, but, you know, other, Rilke came into one, I remember. Mm -hmm. I mean, various writers that appealed to me um, mm -hmm. snuck into titles. I'm not sure exactly why, mm -hmm. but from the very beginning, I really loved Lorca. And all along, there's been a kind of a dance between what I'm reading and, and the way my work goes, even though it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't illustrate anything. It's not about that. It's about something up here, if you follow my... Do you think ever about the work as kind of a practice of writing itself? I mean, you building narratives or? It's hard to answer that. It is hard to answer that. You know, it's a very obscure kind of question that one doesn't question oneself about really. I mean, it's an interesting idea. Yeah. Now that I'm writing, <laughs> I find it actually soothing to write because I don't feel obligated to do <laughs> like a five decade career or whatever it is. It's just freebie, you know? I love that. If I feel stressed, I just go to the computer and I start writing memoir. So you've been writing your memoir now. You have 250 pages. It started with the pandemic. As an exercise, because you were trapped? I, you know, I was, like the rest I was, of us? Like going, getting away, and I thought, get, get as far away as possible. Yeah. So I was pretty much by myself. And I didn't have a lot of my toys, you know, which I have in my studio, like my printer and, you know, my, yeah. all my equipment now with the photography uh, part. And I sat down and I thought, why not just, really, I really just sat down and thought, why not just make a, make a structure? Mm -hmm. Chronological structure, just to see what it gives me. Of your life or of your work, or both? My life. Oh, okay. But then, of course, your life is your work. Everything about it. Right. From birth. It informs your work. They're inseparable. They're, they're inseparable. Uh, yeah. I'm sure every artist just about says that. Oh, I think so many artists try to pretend that's not true. 
They try to pretend it's not true? Yeah. Why? But I, I don't know, but I think it's been a dominant theme of like most post-war. I mean, I think, and that's one of the things that for me really has always set your work apart, especially from the kind of generation that it's most associated with, so maybe land artists, is there's a kind of personal positionality that's always been there. Your travels, your location, your touch of the material, um, kind of even before you were really talking about the language of feminism, a kind of feminist strategy that's deployed in that practice. And I know that you don't think of the work as expressly political, but I think that that nonetheless has a kind of charge to it. And Anna Lovett talked a little bit about well, that. Well, occasionally that may creep into it, but yes. I, it's never deliberate. Right. But it's, in fact, yes. deliberation is not something that interests me a great deal. Because I think as an artist, if you start deliberating, you're forcing something onto your imagination that is foreign. Yeah. That's why I, I, I was a little resistant to the use of words, because words are very specific. Mm -hmm. they, they have a specific meaning. I prefer to kind of sneak into something, <laughs> really, and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. rather than saying, I'm going to do a piece about this or that, that, that or that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, in a way, the only, the closest I've gotten to that is when I want to do a selfie piece. Mm -hmm. There is a reason to do something. Mm -hmm. Of course, it doesn't, it doesn't necessitate one thing or the other in terms of materials or how you're going to do it. It's just a vast cosmic idea. <laughs> um, yeah, that's okay. That's all right. As long as the idea is so kind of, first of all, it has to be an idea that you're really passionate about. Right. But secondly, I think it has to be something that only you alone can catch for yourself and hope that you transmit it. That what you do, yeah. somebody else can relate to in some way. I mean, right. Yeah. That way. Yeah. Feeling. When you make, so there's a work in this exhibition that's a self portrait. <laughs> Um, which is a later work relative to um, some of the things on view. And it, in, it includes, you told me recently that it includes um, some pieces of, or pages of oh, yes. the new memoir. Yes, well that was kind of, actually that was just uh, an almost a priori last minute addition. You were you like, know, toss them in. The piece, <laughs> I did the piece. I, I actually was trying to do a self-portrait. I looked at the piece, relatively finished, you know, it was about mm -hmm. plants and the environment and everything and travel. It's got a suitcase, suitcase in it. Yeah. Suitcase, binocular. Right. And I thought, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, it may be all artists in a way, because they're all, all artists, they're like perusing the world in some weird way, you know, in or out. But when I, when I realized that it was yeah. a kind of self-portrait, <laughs> I thought, well, I'll just put some of the pages in the memoir. <laughs> That's how it got there. To seal the deal. But you wouldn't know that looking, right? That, those pages are there. They're hidden. Yeah, they're for you, sort of. And now, now we've just told everybody, so it's for you guys too. Um, but I so now you're right. There is writing in, in one of the words. <laughs> well, there's, and there's writing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what I like about, or what speaks to me about that strategy of yours, which is to put that really personal position into the work without necessarily stating it, um, is it kind of shows that you've always operated, or a strategy that I think is always there in your work um, from a kind of personal position. So it's not, there's no pretense to objectivity or any of the, um, or kind of 
scientific objectivity, should we say, um, or even aesthetic objectivity. It's always coming from this kind of grounded position. Um, and I think that's um, kind of, sorry. I just want to say, a, a good example of what we were talking about in a way is that piece right there. That piece, and if I could remember yeah. the title of it. I'd Hold on, I'll tell you exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I have this in front that of me. That piece came from an experience that I had that, I mean, if you, I don't think anybody else in the world would have it. <laughs> right. And I don't know how many people will actually realize it. But it came from an experience that I had encountering a grave of my great grandmother in New Zealand. In New Zealand, in a small, very small cemetery that's like half this room with a little church. And the sun was going down. It was very cool and getting twilight. And I was standing there. And all the little sheep <laughs> were going from pasture to farm mm -hmm. along the rim of the cemetery. Mm. And their little bells were tinkling. And I thought, oh my God, this is the most magical moment. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. It's like one of those moments that you just want to capture. But then, you know, I went on with my travels. I came back and I did that piece. And it's called? Because that's a night sky. It's containers with sheep's milk, a little sheep molds in mm -hmm. the milk mm -hmm. but it's wax and it's like a a, a granite like the like, mm -hmm. a table yeah like in the cemetery right so it's called sheep's milk and the cosmos for elizabeth rawlings hogan anybody who's interested is it i well one thing that i i have read about this piece um that you said once which i will share just because it cracked me up is that you relate to sheep profoundly. <laughs> Anybody with New Zealand relatives relates to sheep profoundly. There are more sheep there than there are people. people. I mean, it is sheep <laughs> and beautiful, but a lot of sheep. Did, I do relate to them, actually, because I, you know, they, a lot of my ancestors came from farm sheep country so you relate to them at a kind of personal the genius. ones that weren't mariners right well that's another topic too is that does the mariner history make it into the memoir because that seems to have been really important to you that you kind of came from a family of mariners or explorers um they were travelers yeah explorers i don't think they had the money to be explorers per se sure but they they certainly traveled a great deal, probably from need mm -hmm. and some from desire. Yeah, the later ones. Yeah. Your uncle for need or desire, because he used to bring you things back, right? Oh, he was amazing. Yeah, he's my great uncle. Oh wow, mm -hmm. he was the, the youngest brother of my grandmother, and he would bring me exotica when I was a child weird things from the South Seas and, you know, non-weird things like beautiful shells. And mm -hmm. I think that excites a child. That's why I said, I think if you're, you start early being an artist and, 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 and looking at things in, in that way of as beautiful or interesting or magical or something that is going to Something that you're going to respond to profoundly. When you, when you had those things that were brought to you, did you arrange them? I mean, how did they live in your life when he would bring them to they, you? They lived on my chest of drawers, mm -hmm. in the drawer and over the drawer. <laughs> and I still have yeah. a few of them. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing that, that you can see that still. So they may turn up in a piece. <laughs> 
I mean, in some cases, it seems like they could already have, right? I mean, not that they have, but that there are shells and other bits of exotica that have found their way into many of your pieces already. The shells actually, a couple of them have turned up in pieces. They are in the show. Mm -hmm. But uh, what piece that was in the last show mm -hmm. that, that is with the San Francisco Museum now, and I hope they put it up sometime, um, has a table mm -hmm. with some of the shells and, right. and craniums and different items, not just shells, but that reflect the cosmos, you know, the evolution. I'm very interested in evolutionary challenges, you know, things that, that a couple of the pieces that I've been working on in the last few years have been the process of evolution from, from, from when we just crawled out of the uh, muck, you know, to when we started imagining, mm -hmm. you know, with the stars. Which is the story of us. I mean, that's us. That's what we are. Right. Stars, you mean. And in between, yeah. we kill one another. <laughs> unfortunately. Well, frequently. Um, I, I think that's an interesting, though, also, there, there are kind of two scales to your work. There's the really, really intimate, the kind of touch, the moment where you're in direct contact with soil and rock. And then the cosmos, right? So you're playing, I think, constantly with this um, divide between the macro and the micro. Um, and oftentimes, I think your work inverts those two things. So um, I'm wondering if that's on purpose or not. But I think about some of the photography pieces that deal with the cosmos. And they are, again, they're kind of these focused um, astrological phenomenon, astro astronomical phenomenon. Um, that are really close up, right? So you have none of the context. Whereas some of the rubbings become these incredible, it's a very specific site, you know, it's soil from this discrete point, but it's manifest into this kind of um, immense topology, right? They all almost look like they could be. Um, That's, th there are other themes, yeah. you know, that like I had a show of boats. Absolutely which was my first boat show. <laughs> and I realized when, when I was, this was uh, in, um, uh, in Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. and I realized that boats really figured enormously in, in the work. That, and I hadn't really thought about that as a, as a theme, really. It's just that I did them. Right. So, so, why? Because there's the ocean is also like the earth in the sense that, you know, you go across, but your, your mark disappears. Mm. Mm. You know, it's, it's the most amazing thing. You know, I took a couple of years ago, I took the Queen, I guess it was the Queen Mary, the only one left, mm -hmm. to England because I didn't want to fly. Yeah. And I kept standing over the edge of that ship and I kept looking and I was thinking how amazing it is that it's leaving this mark <laughs> that is disappearing immediately. Right. I mean, it's so poetic, really, and that we all have left this mark around the world for centuries. Right, but looking for something, yeah. you know? This idea of it getting the earth kind of over, to, this relationship between mark making and disappearance is really beautiful and I think incredibly evocative of how you've, your work has um, earth, evocative of an aspect of your work that is this through line, this kind of touch, right? Kind of moments of touch. And um, going back to the idea of inscription, these kinds of memorializing those moments of touch, like moments of. Um, I 
wonder kind if you of, do that with the ocean. Yeah, because that is the central difference, right? You can fossilize in some way that moment of. Well, I came back and I did a piece with a boat, and then I did the topographical <laughs> yeah. drawing, but it's not the same. You know, right. it's, it's the way we see something, mm -hmm. but it's different the way we kind of embrace movement, movement itself. That's what's so great about sailing. I still resent all the sailing lessons I had to take as a child. I don't know, I found it scary. <laughs> Sounds scary. Yeah. Well, I just found sailing scary. Yeah. I mean, the, the immensity of, of being on the water and being so close to the water and going so fast and, you know, me being the person in control of the instrument. You can tell I'm a bad driver. Um, <laughs> don't want that control. Did you sail when you were younger? Yes. Yeah. You clearly enjoyed it. I was it. very fortunate. I yeah. had two friends that had boats. Mm -hmm. One had, one friend father had a yacht, a 58 foot yacht. Wow. And he had two sons that had no interest. So Martha and I crewed for him. Oh, cool. And we would go to Catalina Island and, you know, it was heaven. Mm -hmm. Sailing. Mm -hmm. And even sleeping on deck, you know, and listening to the music wafting out from the casino and just looking up at the stars. And, you know, the boat rocks you to sleep. It's really, you know, it's, it's an amazing experience. Yeah. A sailboat. Yeah. Yeah. Was the other boat that you sailed was smaller. Yes. Yeah. The other one was the lake boat. Yeah. yeah. It was the crew. Pathetic <laughs> crew that it was. Was that, I imagine that's not true. Was that kind of the beginning of travel for you? Because the first big trip you take, you're 16, right? Mexico. Right, that's Mexico, right after high school. Yeah. But you're already, so the sailing was kind of your first, did you take road trips before then? I mean, not very much because, you know, there was a war. <laughs> Remember? Yeah. I grew up in a really strange time. I mean, it was the 30s. Mm -hmm. And people didn't have a lot of money, or at least most people. And then there was World War II. And what you did was you went around the neighborhood and collected papers and tin and, you know, uh, et cetera. I was, you know, nine, 10, mm -hmm. 11. So, you know, it's a, it was a very, um, it's a strange time to grow up in a way, I think, you know. What were your parents doing during that? My father yeah. went. Right. He was fighting. Yeah. yeah and came back a mess, you know, mm. so. So the war was not good to my family at all. Mm. Yeah, it was very, um, um, I think they're rarely good. Wars aren't they're, good. Yeah, they're pretty bad in general. As we know, no. Um, so, but I have to say, there's a postscript. Okay. Both my parents were very supportive of my work. They liked they liked my work, and they 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 were, you know, my mother would put it up on the wall and say, "Oh look, <laughs> wait till Daddy comes home and sees this." You know. So <laughs> I was lucky. Yeah, I remember you describing. Um, some early experiences with your parents and thinking they put so much, they enabled so much self-confidence in you and that they seem to have had an immense amount of trust. I tell judgment. you that. You did, you're telling, you were telling me a story about going to um, Sunday school and your father giving you a kind of choice about it, right? Right. And well, you, well, you should tell it. Well, I All said I didn't like it. He yeah. said, I wanted you to find out for yourself. <laughs> Yeah. No, he did that with everything. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, he was very good. He put me in a pit of snakes once. I thought my mother was going to die. I mean, that's terrifying. 
And I survived. He asked the man, you know, what's well, going to happen to her if we do that? <laughs> he said, can I put her in with the snakes? And I guess the guy said, yes. And there I was with all those snakes. How old were you? A little tiny, you know, like six or seven. Oh my God. Seriously, I'll never forget it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was so confident because he always said, you know, don't worry, I'll take care of you. Yeah. Don't worry. Did you get, and nothing happened, right? Nothing you can, happened. You took care of me. But that's an incredibly, I mean, I think not everybody's parents give them. Well, <laughs> not everybody's parents drop them in a pit of snakes out of love. Um, <laughs> oh, that was not the only, you know, I have more stories, believe me. I mean, he once held me over Boulder Dam. Oh my God and said, don't worry. <laughs> I have to say, I don't like heights a lot. Yeah. You know, it didn't, it didn't really endear me to high places. <laughs> but I think, you know, I, I actually have thought about this recently because I think some parents do things that seem like folly in retrospect, but they're really, they're really teaching methods. Right. I'll let him off the hook on that one. <laughs> I think they, I think they, they worked. Well, I think they gave you a sense of self assuredness that is been profoundly useful and generative for you right? in life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also maybe part of that, that confidence to be positional, to put yourself in the work um, in the ways that you do. So that's remarkable. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, find, I find actually writing lately very, very informative about everything in the work. Mm -hmm. Maybe Maybe every artist, I mean, not every artist, artist wants to do this, but I think it would be a lot of artists just to kind of pull their thoughts together because you learn a lot. Right. It's not for others, it's for you. You know, it's for you yourself. I have learned a lot. Do you think you can only do this at this stage in your career and your life? That's or a like good question, probably. Yeah. Luckily, I live long enough. Yeah. <laughs> I think if I, I think if I had thought about doing it earlier, I would have said to myself, "It's taking time away from my work," because mm -hmm. I always, I, I never wanted to take time away from my work, because I think an artist gives up their life in a way for their work hopefully they like doing what they're doing <laughs> it's a long road if not yes. yeah but um but now you know i feel i can i feel comfortable with it but you've always kept journals right and i've seen some of the journals from the 70s and they're filled with soil samples and maps and notes and writing your journals so what and the, oh i always kept journals yeah. traveling right and then and that is one of the reasons I, I started putting this together because I had those notebooks and yes. it, they were written already. Not, not, you know, in extended prose. They were yeah. notes. Yeah. But that's a big help. And I did that because when I was traveling, not all the time, but most of the time, I wanted little key. Well, I made little drawings mm. too, usually. I kept, I took right. a book and I would make little drawings, <clears throat> not so much drawings like landscapes, but little things to remind me of these things. Yeah. And the same thing with the notes. Like, yeah. you know, if, you're, if you go to a place and you, you see something, and I realized writing about it, that the world has changed so radically in the last few years and in the last 20 years 
that all those places are totally different now. Mm. All the places that I have notes on, they don't, some of them don't exist anymore. Right. And, and there are groups of people that barely exist anymore. And, you know, Christians in Muslim countries that have a little enclave mm -hmm. and I don't know if they're still there, mm. but I went to some really strange burials of people that, you know, where they, they massacred animals. I mean, I don't know if I could even deal with it today, but I saw it. Yeah. I was there. Um, very, you know, there's, there's, we all experience all of these things in our life, but we rarely note them. Mm. And they leave, they, you know, but all this is history. Right. You know, and to people that come afterwards, it's important. Absolutely. It shouldn't be lost. So I think with that, we're going to open it up, Michelle, to ask. I think that's a really beautiful moment to pause on to say if there are any questions. Does it work online as well? So, okay. <laughs> Uh, from the online audience, uh, and the question is, uh, the, the person notes that you've used graphite in a number of the works in the show. Yes. And how do you pulverize the rock since, you know, isn't graphite in its original form quite heavy and big? It actually is. And for example, in that piece right there, Mm -hmm. um, this one or, or the, the, or the one both, of them. both of them? Um, I found the graphite in the graphite quarry between El Cazigua in Guatemala and Copan in Honduras. And it was in chunks, yes. And some of the chunks had red iron oxide stratifications in it, and others were pure graphite. And Beautiful. I mean, it's almost almost like you could say, I think I want a ring of graph. I mean, it, graphite is really beautiful. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. When it's smooth, it's, you know. I'm just going to grab a chair. So I'm the same height. Sorry. Yes, join us. Yeah. Um, yes, well, I smashed it. How else would I? <laughs> and did you use a tool to yeah, smash it? Yeah, sometimes I use a tool, yes. Okay. Um, to our audience online, if you'd like to add a question to the chat, I'll propose it to Alexis. Um, another question from the audience online is, would you say it was there was a decisive moment or a first impulse when you were doing land art or recording time in the landscape? What, what do they mean by decisive moments? I guess, did you have an aha moment? That's how I uh, understand it. What was it a, you know, I'm sure it was a gradual evolution. Well, I actually said one. Yeah. So when you were talking earlier about imprints, right, that being the kind of first moment where you wanted to touch. The That's soil. an aha moment. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, <laughs> so Gustavo, it, there was an aha moment. Gustavo is asking that question. Yes, um, there, yes. Well, I, you know, there are probably quite a few aha moments, but. In 1969, that was. Yeah, yeah. I would say 1969 was a, a kind of pivotal mm -hmm. moment. 68, 69. Yeah, for many artists. Yeah. And does anyone here have a question for Alexis? who has so much experience with Michelle's work and many artists. <laughs> Here's your opportunity. Ask a curator. <laughs> Hopefully just Michelle's. There's a hand. So, yeah, so, I mean, what did you do to respond to Michelle? Carrie, I'm just going to repeat the question because I have the mic. Um, so Carrie's question to Alexis is, what draws you to Michelle's work and what makes you interested to explore more? 
Um, so I still remember the first time I saw your work, which was at the Sculpture Center. It was the Sayerville Scotta Quartet as part of this group of, um, a group show that featured women who were kind of associated with land art. And the Sayerville Strata Quartet is four scrolls uh, in four different, from four, four different strata of soil at a brick quarry, um, quite a famous brick quarry in Sayerville. And for me, I was really drawn to studying minimalism at the time. And I was drawn to this kind of um, A, take on the monochrome, this kind of radical take on the monochrome as a kind of um, trope. Um, and be the way in which the hand kind of emerges in that work, despite it's it was a very you know, difficult piece to make. Right, I've heard you describe. You just had to rub and rub very and very difficult. Cut your hands out. He, first of all, to get it all mm -hmm. even, oh. not easy. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, and they're huge. Yeah. yeah, because it's what? How how big is it? hundred and I don't know. 68, 168 inches, something like that. They're, yeah, enormous. I'm not good at They're inches. like 14 feet or something. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. So it's big. It, it's big. And it, it's hard to yeah. get it even. It's very hard. I mean, I don't go around saying, oh, how hard it is to, you know. But looking back on it, those big scrolls were, were very difficult. So we have a, another question from the audience. Uh, Michelle, you said you have learned a lot during the process of writing the memoir. I'm curious if you have learned. So the, oh, I've been talking about it. <laughs> the, the question is, what has Michelle learned in the process of writing her memoir? Well, I've learned that I was very lucky not getting into trouble in a lot of places, <laughs> seriously. I mean, a, a lot of places that I went, I went by myself. And um, when I think about it today, it, it, it couldn't be done today. It wouldn't be done today, let me put it that way. It could be done, of course, anything can be done. But it, it probably was very unlikely to be done then, too. But, um, but on the other hand, it opened me up to a world that, you know, traveling alone in Morocco, what an experience, you know, barreling down this road in Morocco, you know, and two, two policemen stopped me, right, in the middle of the desert. They, appeared out of nowhere and I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> I mean, this is so I stopped, of course, and, you know, in French, they demanded my passport, you know, really nastily, really nastily, and I fidgeted around a little bit and I got, you know, my passport out and I handed him my passport. When I opened my passport, my dog's picture was in it. <laughs> Right over my picture, and they both burst out laughing. I mean, it was it was like a riot, you know. And it totally changed the whole mood. Well, you know, you're in a war zone. I said, No, I didn't know I was in a war zone. I mean, how do I get out of a war zone? You know, very nicely. And they said, Well. All you do is you go down, you follow this road for about six or seven miles. I said, I was actually looking for a place to swim, and I was. And then you turn right, and you come upon two buildings, and there's Le Piscine. Le Piscine. <laughs> or whatever it is. And, you know, and it's only like two Durhams. It's like really, you know. A bargain. A bargain. <laughs> so I went. <laughs> and, you know, it, it changed everything. I went and I went in and <laughs> the pool was full of very surprised Berbers, you know, nude. And, and they all looked at me like, hum, <laughs> what is she doing here, you know? And then one of the little ones came up and got fascinated with my earring. Hmm. 
And when she did that, the abuela, the old one, started laughing and it totally changed the mood. I mean, it was, you know, because people are people and something happens that, that makes something humorous or d they decide you're not going to you know, pull out a gun or something or you're just a person too. And it, it, so those are the good things about traveling alone. Because when you travel with any other people, you're, 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 you're embracing them. You're mm, not going not out to be vulnerable to others. And, and, and I think that's the plus in traveling alone, I think. Did you get a good answer? I got the best answer. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Absolutely. I can't hear a word you saying. I'll repeat the question. Can I paraphrase what you just said? So um, uh, this uh, uh, woman said that what has always had a big impact for her in your work is the intimacy. Even when there is a large work, she feels the gesture of your intimacy. Am I saying it correctly? With the with the object. Thank and you. I, I appreciate that very much. I, is there a question? A, a question behind or a, a, no? Comment. And, and she thanks you. And you have a question. So the question is, what is Michelle reading right now? And I'm sure she's reading many books. Um, I, don't, I, I don't even know how to answer that. I have a lot of problems reading right now, actually, because I have a lot of problems with eyes. Mm. So I have to do a lot of eye things, and it's, it's difficult to read. I can, and I've been reading on, you know, on the computer because it's backlit, but I'm having a lot of eye problems, so. But Michelle, are you listening to anything on tape? Sometimes. As a, yeah. Yeah. Actually, the last thing I was reading was um, Speak Memory. Oh. By Nabokov, to answer your question. It's not as good as I expected. <laughs> Honestly, I really think he's a wonderful writer, and I, I love other things that I've read of his. But Speak Memory did not live up to what I, to my expectations. I thought it was going to be a more profound kind of memoir. And <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> you know, it's all about his childhood in Russia, and it's not that interesting. It was so to him, I'm sure. <laughs> but, you know. So, uh, Anne has a question. So uh, Anne has made an analogy between your desire to, or asking if there's a relationship between your desire to travel alone and experiencing things as a solo traveler and working alone. Do you prefer? Oh, I always work alone. I always work alone. I mean, that doesn't mean I don't use assistance. I have one assistant that has been 12 years about. 
and he's quiet as a mouse and at, and at a distance. And he takes care of, you know, the photographs and answering things and stuff like that so that I don't have to. Not that I can't use the computer, but he can use it better than I can use it. And now I have another occasional assistant for the last couple of years, different ones, to pack things and put things in storage and take them out of storage and do those those things. I mean, I used to be able to lift 100 pounds and I was very proud of myself. Now I have trouble lifting my computer. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, you know, you start, you start losing um, all those wonderful attributes you had when you were 30 or something. But yeah, I, I, but I work alone and I really don't like people around me that much. I really like to be alone. I think sometimes I think about it and I think I was an only child and I had my own room and it was fine. I liked it that way. <laughs> I remember my mother saying, wouldn't you like a little brother? And I said, no, <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> so, you know, it just, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say that traveling, traveling with another person that travels well is, is great. It's just not exactly the same for that person or for me. It's fine and I've done it many times um, and, and enjoyed it many times. It, it, the, one, the, the years that we were talking about, I was taking trips by myself because I wasn't with anybody. And, um, yeah. May I ask a question to Alexis? Sure. And that will be our last question uh, before we close. Um, where do you see Michelle's work in sort of the context of history and the 20th and 21st century? Um, that's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of pressure to answer that. Um, I, I can say for me what I, I think some of the questions that I was asking kind of get at where I see the work, which is in relationship to um, the emergence of minimal art, conceptual art, and land art, um, and these strategies. And I think what's fascinating to me is Michelle's kind of in the thick of it as in, you're in New York at the same time, you know, through Holt, you have Lucy Lepard as a close friend, you're kind of in a world with them, but you operate, your work is always operated quite independently. So it's in a conversation, but has a kind of, I don't know, at times, I'm sure at the time, it was almost um, uh, not at odds with, but kind of, there's a kind of the, again, to go back to this, not to overuse the idea of intimacy here, but the kind of the emphasis on touch and the hand and kind of direct contact, bodily kind of contact, I think, um, is what sets it apart and why it has such lasting appeal. I also think today um, the uh, kind of ecological impulse, the way you look at and preserve the earth, there's a kind of memorializing function to the work, again, that um, in the moment of incredible climate crisis feels, has an urgency that um, I think was there. I mean, we knew about the climate crisis then too, but has taken on a new urgency. And I think it's one of the things that gives your work such, um, it makes your whoa, work so interesting to so many younger, younger artists today. There's a kind of prescience to it um, that has lasting appeal. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> so, yeah. so thank you all. I, I want to thank Michelle for her generosity. I want to thank Alexis for your beautiful questions and your presence. And thank all the audience who is here today with us and the audience listening online. I also, on behalf of everyone at Gallery La Long, thank you for joining us. Thank the Gallery La Long team for setting up such a beautiful event. And you can see Michelle's work here for another week the imprints of time at Gallery La Long and forever online. Um, oh, and of course, and there will be a docu, there's a documentary in process 
uh, with the, our producer, Karen Shapiro, here, which we hope will come out sooner rather than later. <laughs> um, uh, what's the name of the production company to look for? BDKSproductions.com. BDKSproductions.com. Mm -hmm. And you can follow us at Gallery Lalong online and gallerylalong.com. So thank you, and thank you for joining us for Dialogues with Michelle Stewart and Alexis Lowry. Have a lovely afternoon.